Hello and welcome back to another video in the Introduction to Windows Forensics series. In this episode, we're going to take a look at volume shadows and how they can provide evidence of historical data. If you've been a subscriber of the channel for a while, you'll recall that one of the earlier videos I created was a tutorial about how to browse volume shadows on a live Windows system, and you can see that video playing here. In the first part of this episode, we'll revisit that concept. Then we'll switch over to the SIFT workstation and look at two included utilities that can help us view and subsequently mount volume shadows from a disk image. So let's get started. Volume Shadow Service, or VSS, has been around since Windows XP Service Pack 2, where it was used by NT Backup. System Restore, which you may remember from the XP days, didn't actually utilize the VSS service. Instead, XP used a more rudimentary copy mechanism that was not as efficient. In fact, it wasn't until Windows Vista that System Restore began utilizing VSS. Volume shadow copies can best be described as a block-level differential copy in 16K chunks. The data is stored in the root of the boot volume in the System Volume Information folder, and on a Windows workstation, the snapshots occur on a weekly basis. On a Windows Server OS, the snapshots occur daily. The service uses approximately 3-5% of your total disk size, versus about 10% used by System Restore in the XP days. And it works in a very similar manner to snapshots within virtualization software. You can have multiple snapshots in any given time, and the feature can also be used, as previously mentioned, by backup software to backup copies of in-use files. In fact, maybe you've heard of red teamers using VSS to obtain copies of ntds.dit on a domain controller. VSS ends up being very valuable from a forensic perspective, so make sure your admins are not turning it off in your environment. If they are, fight them on it because there's absolutely no reason to disable it. This is not System Restore from the XP days, it's not a resource hog, and there's simply no good reason to justify turning it off in your environment. As an example of its value, consider an attacker on a system, and the attacker wishes to cover his or her tracks. So let's say there's some contraband on the system, and the attacker wishes to delete it and uses sdelete or some similar piece of software to overwrite the file, making it unrecoverable. But the attacker may not have considered the possibility that the file may exist in a previous volume shadow despite the fact that it's been securely deleted. We can find previous copies of the registry, Windows event logs and other log files, previous copies of files from user profile folders, and numerous other things that can prove to be extremely useful in an investigation. So now let's take a look at a Windows 10 VM and see how we can mount one of the volume shadow copies and explore its contents. We'll first do this using the method in the previous video I mentioned, and then we'll look at a new tool from Eric Zimmerman that makes the process even easier. Now let's take a look at two different methods that we can use to browse volume shadow copies on a live Windows system. For either method, we'll need an administrative command prompt. So let's go ahead and pull one up. And the first thing we'll do is run VSS admin list shadows to look at the current volume shadows on the system. Because this is a virtual machine that remains suspended most of the time, you'll notice that there are only two present, the newest of which I manually created while I was setting up this lab environment. So keeping that in mind, let's go ahead and change into the user's desktop directory. And the first method will use a single built-in Windows command called mklink. This creates a symbolic link not unlike the ln command on a Linux box, if you're familiar with that. We'll use the slash d option to create a directory symbolic link, which we can name anything. In this case, I'll just call it demo. And because I am in the desktop directory, it will be created on our desktop. And now for the target, we'll specify one of these shadow copy volume paths that you see here. I'll grab the oldest one and we'll paste it here. And we're almost done, but there is one final step that is very important, and that is to put a trailing backslash at the end of this shadow copy path. In fact, I'll go ahead and leave that off and show you what happens. 
It appears to work, but when we click on demo, we'll actually get a permissions error and it will not work. So let's go ahead and delete that symbolic link and try again, this time including the trailing backslash. And now we will be able to browse the volume shadow. So you can see this looks like the root of C. And if I go into users and then look at the user's desktop, you will notice quite a few files on the desktop that are simply not present on the live system. Just to show you a side-by-side -side comparison, we will load up the live system and put that desktop on the left side and the volume shadow desktop on the right side. And as you can see, there are quite a few files that are simply not present on the live system, but that are present in the volume shadow copy. So again, this is using a single command. The advantage here, it's completely built in. And of course, the disadvantage is that you will have to manually create a symbolic link per volume shadow copy path that you wanted to browse. But next, we can actually use a tool called VSC mount from Eric Zimmerman that will make the process even easier. So let's go into our tools directory and into VSC mount. And if we run VSC mount, we'll specify dash dash DL for drive letter, which in this case will be C and dash dash MP for the mount point, which I will simply call slash demo. And when we do this, you will notice that it says creating directory slash demo underscore C mounting VSCs to slash demo underscore C. And as seen here, it found the two volume shadow copies that we saw with VSS admin. So now let's go ahead and take a look at that directory, which is here. It's actually a mount point, and when we click on it, we will see those two volume shadows, and I can browse them as I would anything else. So we can change into the desktop directory, and once again, we see that same volume shadows contents. So the advantage here, of course, is that if we have numerous volume shadow copies, they would all show under the mount point, allowing us to very easily traverse them. But of course, the disadvantage is that it is an external third-party tool that we would need to download. However, it is only a single standalone executable, so that's good. So now you've seen two different methods that we can utilize to browse volume shadows on a live Windows system, both of which are extremely easy to use. The first, of course, was MKLink, and the second one was VSC Mount from Eric Zimmerman. So in the next and final section of the video, we'll attach an external drive to our SIFT workstation VM and take a look at the included utilities there that will enable us to interact with and mount volume shadow copies on the SIFT workstation. So let's wrap up the video by taking a look at that next. As you've probably seen within other 13 cubed episodes, we're again going to be using the SIFT workstation for this section of the video. The SIFT workstation is provided free of charge from SANS to the forensics community and it includes a large number of forensics tools that I've used not only in other 13 cubed episodes, but also in real world forensic investigations. You're looking at the included SIFT workstation cheat sheet. And on the second page of the cheat sheet in the bottom left, you'll notice a section called mounting volume shadow copies. In stage two, you'll see reference to a command called V shadow mount. And there's also another sister command called V shadow info. Both of these rely on something called the libvshadow library, and that's what we're going to be taking a look at here. Let's go ahead and minimize the cheat sheet. And I have an external drive connected to the SIFT workstation, and you're looking at a 15 gig E01 Windows 10 disk image. First off, if I run vshadow info against the disk image, it's actually going to tell us that there are no volume shadow snapshots found. That's because we need to first mount the E01 disk image so that we can look at its raw, uncompressed form. To do that, we'll use EWF mount, and we'll go ahead and use the included mount point of EWF mount, though you could mount it anywhere you'd like. If we change into that location, we will now see the raw 200 gig disk image. If I again run vshadow info against this, you'll notice now we see two different volume shadow snapshots that are available to us. The next step is to run the vshadow mount command. We'll specify EWF1 as the source and we'll mount it to slash mount slash VSS. 
if we go to Mount BSS now, you'll notice we have two different 200 gigabyte volume shadow disk images. Now we could use the included Linux mount command two different times, one for each of these and mount them both. Or as shown on that cheat sheet I just showed you, we could use a bash for loop to iterate through any number of VSS images listed here and mount them automatically for us. So that's what we're going to be doing. To do this, we'll simply type for some variable, I'll choose I as you saw on the cheat sheet. So for I in VSS star, which will get any number of these, including one and two in this case, a semicolon, and now we'll say do mount. We're gonna specify dash O for our options, and we're going to use the following options. Read only, loop, because this is an image file and not a physical device, so we need to use loop. Show sys files so that we can see our hidden NTFS metadata files. And then we'll use streams underscore interface equals windows so that we can see any present alternate data streams. Now, what are we mounting? Well, that will actually be included in the variable $i, which will be VSS1 and VSS2 on each pass of the loop. And then where are we mounting it? Well, we'll mount it to slash mount slash shadow mount and then dollar i. Then another semicolon and done. This will take just a couple of seconds to complete. And when it does, we'll actually be able to change into slash mnt slash shadow mount. And you'll notice that there are two different ones that are highlighted in green here. VSS1, VSS2. This indicates that these two images are mounted. So if I simply run LL VSS1 and then LL VSS2, you can see what looks like the root of the C drive on these two different disk images. And it's just that easy. So to recap, we started with an E01 compressed in-case image. We mounted that with EWF mount so that we could access the raw disk image itself in its uncompressed form, which was 200 gigabytes in this case. We ran vshadow info against that raw image and saw that there were two volume shadows available. We then used vshadow mount to mount those to the mount VSS mount point. And then we used a bash for loop to iterate through any of those mounted volume shadows so that we could actually mount them in a way that we can interact with them on this file system. And that's all we did. And now we have the full snapshot in time on that Windows system for both of these volume shadow snapshots. So it's literally like taking a time machine and going back to look at things exactly as they were on the creation date of that snapshot. So as you saw, this was a 200 gig disk image Therefore, each of the volume shadows would be 200 gigs. So if you had 10 of them, you would literally have 10 200 gigabyte disk images to peruse. So that's pretty much all I wanted to show you in this episode. You have seen the value, hopefully, of volume shadow copies, and you've seen how easy it is to use both live utilities on a Windows system to mount them and interact with them, and then also to look at a dead disk image using something like the SIFT workstation. So I hope that you will consider using these in your investigations because there are a ton of different artifacts that you can pull out of these volume shadow copies. Each one, as I said, is like a complete copy of the disk. So you might find log files and various other things that have since rolled off or even things that have been intentionally deleted from the live system. As always, I would like to thank you for taking the time out of your day to watch this episode. I hope that you have found it informative and useful. And please do consider subscribing to the channel if you have not already. That would really help me out. And I will catch you in the next episode.